your information will be um, a very uh, a nice set the stage for for the uh, talks and discussion that will take place uh, uh, for today and tomorrow. So thanks again. So now I'd like to hand uh, over to uh, Rich Edwards, uh, who is a, a research associate working here at the Ecological Restoration Institute at Northern Arizona University. He is going to moderate the, the, our first panel session. Uh, Rich. Thank you, Han. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the first panel for our, our for today, um, entitled "Recent Experiences in Steep Slope Logging Operations." Uh, we have three excellent speakers uh, on tap, basically with with very relevant, up to date information on this subject matter. Uh, just remind folks that we'll be taking questions at the end of all three of our panelists. So, if if the question, if you can direct the question to the individual panelists, if, if you can, or if not, we'll just throw it out to the to all three of them if, it, if it's a general question. But anyway, so that's just a reminder on that. But without further ado, I'd, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Hunter Harrell, and that um, he will be presenting on innovative ideas and steep slope logging. Um, Hunter is a he's Dr. Hunter Harrell, and currently he's, he's assistant professor of forest operations at Humboldt State University in Arcata, California. His current research efforts focus on steep slope harvesting operations, such as cable logging and tethered, i.e. winch assist, falling and extraction. Uh, Hunter started his career in the industry working in the Redwood region of California for Green Diamond Resource Company. That's a large private industrial forest owner and then spent almost a decade studying and working in New Zealand uh, as lecturer and teaching forestry as a researcher providing outreach and extension services to uh, New Zealand industry. He has provided technical advice on tethered harvesting practices to the California Board of Forestry to aid in the development of new forest practice rules. And he's co-taught numerous workshops worldwide on the subject. I, I was lucky enough to attend one of his workshops in 2018 at the Pacific Logging Congress in the woods show in Corvallis um, really well. Was really impressed with Hunter. And I'm sure you will be. Um, please, please welcome Hunter, Hunter Harrell. Thanks, Rich. Um, hopefully you all can hear me and, um, and see my screen. I've got it up now. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, so I'd like to share with all of you today some, you know, my topic is called Innov Innovative Ideas and in Steep Slope Logging. And as uh, Rich said, I spent some time in New Zealand. I spent some time overseas in various countries um, viewing steep slope blogging. So I've seen a lot of innovative ideas and, and new things people are trying. And I'd like to share with you today some of those things. Um, you note, uh, you will see trade names uh, such as the machine pictured here on the first slide, as well as some, um, forest practices in other countries like New Zealand where there's endless clear cut limits. And uh, I don't necessarily endorse either or wearing shorts, but you can see me there in the middle standing in New Zealand wearing shorts. It's just something you do over there. Um, so today what I'd like to do is I'd like to cover um, really three kind of topics. So all around steep slope logging operations, but I'd like to talk about some of the new machinery and, and Lauren's cued into that. Um, some new tools uh, that people are using to help and also some new techniques people are trying all in steep slope logging operations. So steep terrain harvesting presents many challenges and you know globally, there's a lot of steep terrain. And by steep terrain, I mean slopes that are over 40% or about 22 degrees is our traditional um, kind of cutoff for conventional ground-based equipment. But on these steeper slopes, you know, in, environmental challenges can be higher. We might have more sensitive terrain um, and we might take uh, greater care in planning uh, to, protect, to protect environmental resources. Uh, safety is, is probably the biggest one that we're all aware of in terms of these steeper slopes uh, present more safety challenges. There's more exposure to hazards 
And this is particularly true for the traditional ta tasks of choker selling, setting and tree falling. Um, if we have to do those by hand, you know, we're working against gravity, trees like to move and, and we are presented with many hazards. Also, we know uh, that productivity tends to be lower uh, on these steep terrain harvesting jobs than traditional ground-based operations, uh, mostly to do with the difficulty of, of extraction or primary transport, typically uphill, creating longer cycle times, and of course, transporting longer distances traditionally than ground-based operations. And as Lauren pointed to, the, the costs really in, increase with the difficulty of these operations. And the costs are, are notoriously higher than ground-based logging. And that typically centers around more specialized equipment like yarders, uh, which are not cheap, so are higher daily costs, but also uh, steep terrain or, or cable logging crews tend to carry more labor in terms of more workers. So they're larger crews. Um, one thing uh, in terms of talking about machinery that's changing the game, uh, cable assist, as Lauren mentioned, is really opening up the doors. And it's something we think of as a, a relatively new practice, especially in the Pacific Northwest. But actually, this is pretty mature. People have been doing this um, since the mid 80s or late 80s in Europe. Uh, initially, the technology uh, was added to forwarders so they could match the slope climbing capabilities of the harvesters and cut flank systems. Um, started out with just simple mechanical drives like a chain drive uh, hooked, to the, hooked to the wheels and hubs that would spin um, the drum in, in that rope. And then later in kind of the 2000s, they expanded the technology to harvesters uh, as the forwarders were keeping up with them and they decided to push slopes a little bit steeper. Um, and they've gotten more advanced too. They're now um, automated, computer controlled. So they've changed a lot over the years. There's over um, probably more closer to a thousand of these, op of these units operating daily in Europe. In the last decade, we've really seen the expansion of uh, this winch technology into New Zealand, uh, which I viewed a lot of the development there, as well as into Canada, and now the Pacific Northwest and South America. And that was really an, adap an adaption in those countries to uh, bring this concept to whole tree logging systems. Uh, so the Europeans call it cable assist because the uh, cable is assisting the machine's traction. Um, and then you can see here some of the machines developed over the last decade, uh, which we refer to as winch assist machines. And these are maybe a little bit more common of what's being used in, in North America uh, for whole tree yarding operations. It's actually different. Um, ISO standards consider these machines different cable assist, assist versus winch assist. Winch assist uh, typically larger, more powerful winch sets, uh, larger ropes, and more pulling force. You can see a number of um, machines here, and, and these are kind of like the ones Lauren had, had pointed out. The winch is on a separate base machine here uh, that's used as an anchor, and then a, a felling machine is, is uh, connected to it. So how do they work? Well, there's two systems, as we pointed out. Um, uh, system A pictured there is more where the winch is integrated into the felling machine itself, like the cable assist systems in Europe. And system B pictured below is more, um, more commonly what's used in the Pacific Northwest and in New Zealand with the separate anchor machines, the winch assist system. Uh, in principle, they both work the same. Uh, it's all about that stability and, and traction that the winch and, and cable provides. So when you're on steep slopes, um, especially with rigid track machinery, you can become unstable or, or tippy and roll over. And uh, the winch helps uh, keep the machine stable. Uh, and as we know from the Europeans and, and we've seen in our trials of our own, uh, it's also providing better traction. So you're not losing traction or spinning wheels or tracks when you're trying to climb up steeper slopes or maybe slopes that aren't that steep, but where the soils are not as strong.
so uh, tethered, uh, we'll call it tethered machinery kind of is a, is a term that's more commonly used here in, in the Pacific Northwest. And it's really referring to both types of system, cable or winch assist. So to keep things simple, we'll refer to all of them as tethered. But basically, tethered uh, technology is well established, as I said. It's really a step change. And by that, I mean a major change in the way we practice felling, but also extraction on steep slopes. So some of these machines are being used for felling. Some of them are being used for forwarding or skidding or shoveling. So it's both felling and extraction applications. As I said, it, it's really providing that stability and traction, which is making um, felling or extracting on these steep slopes physically feasible, which wasn't the case a few decades ago. There are people who have had great success with um, this machinery, and there's also people who have had um, troubles adopting it. And really what we've found through experience so far is it's best used with, one, you need a really experienced operator, somebody who's already good at felling on steep slopes, uh, because this is a little bit more challenging. You need that purpose-built machinery. And as you can see, there's a lot of options out there now that are commercially available, but it does have to be a, a special purpose-built machine for this application. And ideally, you need strong and stable soils. Um, and that's another area of, of concern and research we'll hear more about later. And ideally, um, you know, I think the people who have had greatest success is where they apply this into their harvesting system, where the bottleneck in the system is either felling or yarding. Typically in most cable yarder operations, the yarder itself is the bottleneck, the lowest producing machine. And if we wanna talk about, you know, some of the, the main theme of this uh, seminar about the pace and scale of treating forest land. Um, you know, this picture on the right here of, of some power lines and some recently burned area reminds me to tell you that, you know, this technology is changing the game in terms of the pace and scale we can treat forest land. We can treat a lot more acres a lot more quickly and cost effectively by mechanical felling. And also, this is opening up the doors for improved productivity in extraction or primary transport. One such way this is really opening up the doors in cable logging is through um, improved cable logging productivity and especially um, through the application of grapple yarding or using grapple carriages with our cable yarders. So uh, one of the biggest differences people note uh, is the improved productivity that comes downstream in the next process of yarding. For years, we've had mechanical grapples pictured in the top left there on swing yarders. And uh, the problem was uh, swing yarders are a relatively expensive machine. There's not um, maybe many as many of them out there as traditional tower yarders. And so really they were the only machines um, designed for the purpose of grapple yarding and did it effectively. Uh, we saw in the last 10 years really a uh, expansion of grapple carriages, new designs um, for uh, bringing grapple yarding capabilities to traditional tower yarders. So that's where you see some of these other carriages pictured here, this blue one, this red one, and the yellow one that are all motorized grapple carriages that have simplified the controls and the amount of ropes used so that traditional tower yarders can now grapple too. Uh, and we even got some innovative contractors using um, all sorts of, uh, I think this is a grapple for helicopter yarding that they've adapted into their traditional uh, North Bend configuration here. So uh, all sorts of grappling, people could become obsessed with grapple yarding after um, tethered falling. In terms of some of the, the new machinery, but also transitioning into some of the new tools. Um, one thing was, you know, some of the swing yarders were designed for running grapple carriages. Um, but as I said, the other tower yarders um, or traditional tower yarders weren't. And uh, so we've seen a lot of development over the last decade in cab and control systems for yarders um, that are designed to optimize the controls, make them simpler, but also more ergonomic. Um, grapple yard 
yarding is, is a pretty stressful task for a yarder operator compared to yarding when you're setting chokers. When you're setting chokers and you're yarding as the yarder operator, you put the brakes on, you sit back for a couple minutes and take a break. When you're grapple yarding, you um, don't get many breaks at all. You're busy all the time. A lot of these um, improvements have come through um, programmable logic computers or PLC systems where they integrate electronic over air or hydraulic controls. So it's a computer system that controls the air and hydraulic system. It's fully programmable, got lots of diagnostics, all sorts of alarm bells pop up and tell you how the system's running, but you can program nearly any drum to function however you want. Um, also, many of these systems now have alarms and things like distance in indicators that tell you how far the carriage is away from the yarder. All these things combined, you know, to really be successful in grapple yarding, you need that precision and, and fine control. If you want an inch of rope, you want it to let out an inch of rope, not two feet. Um, so that's what these uh, new control systems are doing. And you can see, um, I like these two pictures here. The top one is actually the same um, yarder as you see in the bottom pic picture, but they took out the old dashboard and controls and was it four brakes and four clutches for every drum there um, and, and simplified them into these two joysticks and a lot better vision out of some of these tabs now too. Another important um, feature, uh, especially for these older tower yarders now converting to grapple yarding is they're using a live skyline rather than a running skyline system like swing yarders are doing. Live skyline, you have to raise and lower your skyline so you can drop that grapple carriage down to the ground. However, when you raise and lower the skyline, you can really dramatically change the tension or amplification of tensions in the rope and possibly up to unsafe uh, limits. So tension monitors have been around for several decades. Uh, maybe you've seen one before. It's like this little three sheave carriage on the back of a tower where the skyline comes up through and they have a, a tension monitor. It's like a digital scale that displays what the tension is. So you make sure you don't overload the ropes, but you also make sure you maximize your payload to get your optimum productivity. The problem with these were was, um, you know, as a yarder operator, you can imagine if, if something goes wrong or gets stressful, probably the last place you're looking is at this little monitor and an alarm bell I think would ring if, if you went over the safe working limit for the ropes. Um, but you know, by the time you got things under control and, and look back to it, um, it might not be displaying the same tension as uh, you previously saw. So it's fluctuating and it's not stored. And if you don't look at it at the right time, you miss what it said. Um, some uh, research project we had a couple of years ago was to convert this into more usable type display. So uh, we re put, basically put a tablet in the cab and turned it into like a heart rate graph at a, at a hospital. So here's the de tension displayed. It's live, it's scrolling along as you're working. You can see the fluctuations in tension. You can see the color-coded zones for the different tension limits. Um, and there's also, it's downloaded, there's statistics, and you can zoom and scroll back and see what happened when you hit that stump or, or whatever happened um, in a difficult or challenging scenario. And this information is really useful because it's helping people learn uh, how their machines are performing, but also help train operators who aren't familiar with operating the system. We also see, um, again, moving towards the, the smaller scale equipment, we're seeing many new um, developments in yoders, so excavators um, that are used for cable yarding in the winch sets and, and controls, again, are improving on those machines. But we're also seeing um, kind of more specialized excavators uh, with their own purpose-built uh, mast or, or tower and reconfigured drum sets to uh, do cable logging on smaller jobs. And those are also being paired with uh, gravel carriages. Here, these machines, both the yarders and uh, the carriages are made by Summit Equipment up in Washington. In terms of European technology, we've taken some trips of loggers from New Zealand over to Europe to uh, take a look around the forest there and see what they're doing. Really impressed with 
um, some of the yarder technology coming out of Europe. Um, Kohler Yarder in Austria uh, has been around for decades and we've seen some of their equipment in the Northwest. And I think many of us were impressed with their automated controls and that the carriage can drive in and out um, on its own and choker setters and the yarder operator can pass the controls back. That technology has been around since the mid eighties um, and it's still around today. But recently they've been making a lot of advancements in diesel electric hybrid engines. So the green and yellow pictured yarder there in the bottom right, um, I had the chance to operate in Austria the other year. And we operated it for a couple hours and we burnt less than a cup of fuel. So these machines have about 70% less fuel use. Sometimes they go multiple weeks between fueling, a year between service intervals where you know they only have to change a little bit of oil in, in your filters. So maintenance costs are reduced. Also, there's some advantages to the electric engines um, that they're putting in the yarders in that they get smooth, uh, constant control and continuous or constant pull in the winch, regardless of how many uh, layers of rope are on the drum. So they always get the highest torque, even at the lowest speed and constant pull, a constant pulling force over any layers in the drum. So some real advantages to um, that technology. Again, they have the automated controls and they've also been extending this into carriages. You can see the ESK, 2.0 there, which is an electric slack pulling carriage. So much like an Eagle or an Acme carriage where the slack is pulled by a little electric motor inside that carriage that is charged every time it goes up and down uh, the rope. Same as in the cable yarder, um, when they break the main line, when they're sending the carriage out, it's charging the, uh, the battery. Um, looking at some more of those tools to help us, and, and I think Lauren pointed it out um, well that, you know, this takes more careful planning um, to make sure that we use this equipment to its best capability when we actually get it out there on site. One thing for cable logging is uh, payload analysis. And payload analysis, while there's been tools in the past, like Logger PC and Skyline Excel, which are great tools, it takes a bit of time to do those computations. And it takes even more time, could take a few hours to do all the payload analysis for a given harvest setting. And it could take a, a few days if you had to go do field surveys or, or run profile surveys out in the field. Um, this payload analysis software has now been upgraded. Um, there's programs like CHIPS, Cable Harvest Planning Solutions, or RoadEng, um, a program traditionally used for road engineering and design um, that now incorporate um, payload analysis into them. Uh, the speed is really what's improved. You can see the um, picture to the right there where you can basically in two clicks, drop your yarder, click another, um, uh, button once to drop your tail hold. And it will um, display several cable spans here, like you can see with color-coded payload charts. So green on those lines is a good payload. Blue is a little bit less. Uh, red or black is not acceptable in terms of a, a payload. So it allows you to analyze multiple corridors very quickly, and you can change or drag around the positions, and it updates everything on the fly. So we're really improving um, the speed in which we're able to do quality payload analysis. Um, and what's uh, really interesting is now what people are doing uh, to help with the planning of, of these types of operations, say where you're tethered falling and then cable yarding, is to download this information and put it inside a tablet in the cab of a felling machine. So when the operator is felling in the felling machine, they know. I'm right next to this skyline corridor. And they also see the payload that you could pick up at that spot. So they know if that equates to two trees, they need to bunch two trees for grapple yarding there. If it's three trees, they'll try to bunch three trees. So trying to optimize that payload and bunch the wood um, and orient it uh, correctly towards the skyline. We've seen drones become really popular. Almost every kid has a drone now. 
and drones are being used um, for all sorts of monitoring, post-harvest assessment work, things like that now, but also for setting up yarders. Traditionally, we said yarders are very high cost and low productivity. Some of that low productivity comes from the setup or relocating the yarder and getting all the ropes set up. Traditionally, we have to pull straw line or haywire, some thin wire rope, and we've got to spool it out by hand across maybe a canyon to set up the yarder. Now we can do that by flying the ropes over with the drone. So my friend Bill Windmill from New Zealand, he was a, an innovative logger and he bought his grandson a, a quadcopter one year and then he's also a deep sea fishing fanatic and he stole his grandson's helicopter and decided to start flying his um, straw line. He initially started out with a small copter flying his fishing line across and then reeling it back across the canyon and hooking up larger ropes then he upgraded to a larger helicopter to do that. Basically, the, the seven millimeter um, synthetic rope he's uh, using are really strong, as strong as steel, um, but only weigh about 40 grams per meter per yard. So it's very lightweight, and that's what's able to um, fly the rope over with the helicopter. This has saved um, Bill a lot of time. He said it takes about two workers less than a half hour to fly the helicopter and straw line across where it could have taken half a day with um, several workers. Uh, and he had a lot of uh, rock bluffs and cliffs in the forest he worked in. So it wasn't the safest for his workers to do that job. Camera systems are making their way um, into all sorts of parts of operations. Um, I like this old picture I pulled from, I think the late seventies or early eighties in British Columbia. We had this idea of video yarding TVs, they called it. Um, as you can imagine back then, uh, electronics and technology wasn't um, good. And, and I think they had problems with running an extension cord out uh, to one of these cameras. As you can imagine, extension cord wouldn't last very long in a logging operation. Uh, but maybe it was an idea that was a bit too far ahead of its time. But nowadays we see um, camera systems like this camera on a tripod that's set up uh, either to view um, grappling for a yarder operator here or really view any part of, of a harvesting operation. So you can see here, here's a newer version. It's a tripod kind of camera. You, you can stick it anywhere in your job. And then somebody um, has a TV screen in the cab of a machine or, or maybe in a pickup truck or something and, and has a remote control where they can pan and zoom and move this camera around. Some contractors I've heard are, are just putting out uh, in the clear cut area uh, where they can't see maybe um, their hand followers. So um, they're keeping an eye for safety on their hand followers. Maybe they're a gully away out of sight and they put this over there or putting it um, further down the road to let them know when the trucks are coming in and out of the site. But originally, you know, its main purpose was to give the yarder operator a different view of, of grappling the logs. Camera systems, as I said, uh, have transitioned from uh, these tripods to basically being embedded or incorporated into all these grapple carriages now. So the motorized grapple carriages above all have cameras in them now to give you a kind of bird's eye view of the grapple. And uh, mechanical grapple carriages here, like pictured in the bottom, have this uh, box that has the camera in it mounted onto the grapple carriage or swing yarders. So everybody has uh, cameras in their grapples nowadays, essentially. Um, moving on to other, other techniques, I guess, um, tools to techniques. Uh, teleoperation. Um, so remote controlled is just where you're um, remote controlling something. You're not in the machine, but you have line of sight. You can see it and you're controlling it. Um, they tried doing this several years ago uh, with remote controlling this John Deere feller buncher. You can see on the left, they originally had this kind of chest pack with controls and a little video screen um, in the bottom there uh, where they could operate this machine. Uh, video cameras are, are really what allowed it to be operated out of line of sight, which is what we're referring to as teleoperation. So you can see a later iteration here where this is a trailer they put on the landing and it's got three 40 something inch uh, TV screens and a, a seat and all the real controls from the machine. So uh, that's the same machine there being operated. 
but by the operators sitting in a cab um, thousands of feet away from the feller buncher. This feller buncher uh, was also tethered, so they had the capability to operate it without an operator tethered on steep slopes. Um, so that happened, I think, five or, or six years ago now. So it is possible, it is out there, and they say they can remote control any John Deere machine in less than an hour. You just uh, go under the seat and tap into the computer. Uh, remote control is extended to, uh, or teleoperation has extended to other machines as well. Here's a, an anchor machine, mobile anchor machine used as an anchor for a skyline system, so a swing yarder in this case. Um, but, you know, a person would be required to move this machine when they had to shift the ropes to harvest the next area. Now they can do that remotely or, or teleoperated. So there's some cameras inside the cab of this excavator and the yarder operator in their cab has controls. So they can turn off the controls to the yarder and turn on the controls for this mobile anchor and move it, dig the bucket and uh, in a way they're working again. So line shifts can take a couple minutes and can be done by the yarder operator themselves. That really transitions into kind of semi-autonomous forwarding. And I put a picture here of this Conrad pulley from Austria. This is kind of like a, a forwarder um, that's cabless and it drives itself down the hill. It's, it's got a winch, so it's kind of winching itself down from the felling machine you can see pictured on the right. Um, so it's, it's funny, you know, we think of uh, maybe ground-based operations being the easier ones to automate machines. But here, uh, the steep slope maybe was an advantage here because um, we have to basically travel in a straight line up and down to this machine. Um, so getting this uh, pulley to drive itself up and down in a straight line it is relatively simple as long as the train's not too undulating. So basically the, the felling machine up there cuts and, and loads uh, similar to what Lauren was described, but uh, here we have uh, the machine driving itself down the hill. Uh, so it's been in use for probably about a decade. Um, the technology is improving and they're trying to incorporate this now into forwarders to make them fully autonomous. I think that's the low hanging fruit if we were to try to automate any machines, um, a forwarder would probably be the easiest. Uh, it takes, um, you know, multiple sensors, cameras and LIDAR sensors, things like that, so the machine can see where it's going. But you also have to train and program the computer system to identify things like, is that a stump? Can I make it over it? How high is the stump? Should I try to go over it? Should I go around? It, it, it's pretty complicated. There's a lot of um, decisions that these machines have to make. Um, and that's challenging, especially in a natural environment, because these conditions are always changing. But that's the future. I do think we'll see more automation coming in, in the near future. You know, it's coming, extending from mining and things like that, where they drive heavy equipment um, thousands of miles away in underground mines in Australia, for example, with no people on site. Uh, but there are many challenges, so uh, it will take some time. I'd like to make some conclusions um, about some of these things I've seen out there, some of these tools, machines, and techniques. And look, basically there's a number of new developments out there and there's, and there's still many more to come. It's a really exciting time to be in forest operations and engineering and, and equipment development. And I think it's similar to um, the pace and scale we're accelerating with computers in that industry, maybe in the early to mid nineties. Uh, basically, a lot of these things are still dependent on engagement and cooperation. You know, uh, some of these things I've showed you were, were prototypes or early commercial products, but they would never made it to where they are now if, if people didn't engage with the process and didn't try to adopt them or trial them. So a lot of these things I can contribute their success to, are there a forest owner or manager saying, will step up and try it or, or a contractor doing something similar. I hear a lot of people, um, I've given similar presentations around the world and I see a lot of people who say, wow, this is amazing. It's really interesting stuff, but 
that will just never work in our area. And, and they have a variety of excuses, um, you know, culture or, or money or, or all sorts of things. But, you know, the people who are having success with the, these systems aren't talking that way. They're the people who are asking, how can we make it work? How can we make it happen? Um, they're the people who are saying, I can't do the same thing over and over. That's the definition of insanity to do the same thing day in and day out. They say there's got to be a better way. So they're really innovative people. To try new things, you have to be innovative yourself. And you know, trying innovative techniques or equipment does take a collaborative approach. Like a lot of hard things in life, uh, maybe we can't do it on our own. So I see the best success from these um, where there's a collaborative approach, maybe between the forest owner, the contractor, or, or even more involved parties. So um, there's many proven models out there and great examples where, um, you know, people have supported each other with uh, time, you know, or resources or, or money to make these things happen. So, you know, some to invest in new equipment and new and innovative ideas takes an investment of time and, and money. And, and some people have come up with kind of cost sharing ways to do that. So look, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the presentation today. And I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thanks, thanks Hunter. We'll, we'll hold questions till the end. Um, as I said, um, when we started, um, in the interest of time, I think we, we might, might want to move on. And, and yeah, thanks for the, that's an incredible amount of new and interesting technology. Um, it's like, it's blinding how, how fast it's being developed. And um, thanks, Hunter. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Anybody has any questions or welcome to type them into the text. Q&A, please. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is... Um, is Bob Rich. Uh, he's a retired regional logging specialist from Region 3 of the U.S. Forest Service, and he's a position which he held for 10 years. Uh, prior to this time with, with the U.S. Forest Service, he was a state trust lands forester for 22 years with the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation in Missoula, Montana, of course. He also taught timber harvesting at the University of Montana for 14 years as an adjunct instructor. And he currently lives in, in Missoula and still teaches in the US Forest Service's uh, Logging Road and Roads Institute, Larry, um, in retirement. And I've taken, taken it from Bob. He's a great, he's a great instructor. Um, I've taken some of his courses both in person and, and uh, virtual. Um, he and his wife uh, also own and operate, uh, operate a noxious weed biological control business in Missoula. But anyway, with uh, no further ado, let's uh, go ahead and uh, introduce Bob, Bob Rich. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking with you a little bit about some steep slope projects that I was associated with in my time down in Region 3. I'm also going to be sharing some thoughts on planning considerations, particularly on Forest Service ground, when we're looking at these types of projects. So without any further ado, I'm going to attempt to screen share here and get right into things. Okay, we talk about some planning for Forest Service steep ground projects in the Southwest and truth in advertising. Uh, none of these projects, none of these photos here were taken in the Southwest, uh, but the projects, uh, most two out of the three were. Okay, when we're working on the Southwest, we've got some some challenges to begin with. We've got a lack of markets, especially for the smaller timber, long haul distances, and unfortunately, fairly low value products at most of the mills that we're working with. Um, when we wanna go onto the steep ground, we've got even a few more challenges. Uh, we've got some forest plan limitations on, on some forests. We have a lack of contractors that can handle that type of work on steep ground. And we've got the invariable increase in cost 
of steep ground operations. But undaunted off to the steep ground we go, and we're not going to address the problems we have with markets and haul distance and product value. Uh, it's a little beyond the scope of this presentation. We're gonna focus primarily on the challenges that deal directly with steep ground. Okay, the first one is the forest plan constraints. Um, some of the older forest plans were from the 80s that we're working with. They're very prescriptive. They will have hard and fast slope limitations, generally 35%. And if you have a plan like that, you're gonna need a, a project specific forest plan amendment as part of your analysis. It's not all that much work, it's just a couple of pages, but the important thing is that all of your specialists have to address that in their analysis, so you have to understand that up front and allow your specialists to incorporate that into their analysis and then do a, a very short forest plan amendment. Your newer plans are not as uh, specific, uh, as prescriptive, excuse me, uh, they'll, they're more end result uh, oriented. Uh, so they will not have those hard and fast guidelines. They'll say something like uh, protect soil integrity um, and minimize adverse soil impacts with equipment operations, something like that. But they won't have that thou shall not go past 35% hard and fast number. Lack of steep ground contractors. Uh, we just don't have contractors in the Southwest <clears throat> that are capable of this type of work. So we wind up importing people from outside of the area and that gets very expensive, bringing them in for a special job. Uh, there's lots of mobilization and logistics, putting people up in hotels, transportation, flying people home, uh, swapping out operators. There's also lots of risk. If uh, a machine breaks, you've got to fly a part in, uh, maybe you have to fly the mechanic in. So there's lots of risk involved. And that all translates into higher cost. Um, if you can develop a long-term program of work and develop local contractors that can work on steep ground, that is going to lower your cost significantly. And we haven't had that uh, to this point. We have had to bring people in uh, for special projects. As I said, that's very expensive. Um, if you can get a thousand acres a year on a local forest, um, that should keep a, a tethered ground-based operation or a skyline crew busy for a year and maybe encourage development of a local contractor. Uh, increased cost. If you're going to be on steep ground, it costs more. Uh, just accept that fact. It's, it's impossible to avoid. The steeper the ground, the higher the cost. Uh, if you can develop one or even several local steep slope contractors, that is going to bring your costs down. Competition is a good thing. Um, however, with our existing economic challenges of the long hauls, the limited markets, uh, I think it's unlikely that you're going to generate a positive stumpage value um, from these types of operations. So just accept that and plan for it. Um, in the future, if we can develop uh, markets that produce a higher value product, well, then maybe we might be in the black on these types of projects like they are um, in the West Coast and the Northern Rockies where they can operate steep ground profitably. That's, that's not where we're at in the Southwest right now. Uh, if you bring an operator in from outside of the area for a 200 acre unit uh, and there's no product value or very low product value, I would, <laughs> I would say between $3,500 and $5,500 an acre. I know that seems incredibly high, uh, but that has been our experience cost. It, it kind of took my breath away from me when we had uh, those, those costs per acres come in, but that's the reality of what we're dealing with. Okay, understanding your potential logging system. I, I think with the limited contractors, um, when we're bringing them in, it's a good idea to leave the project open to different logging systems rather than restrict them to a certain type of tether or skyline. If you can leave it open to uh, skyline, uh, helicopter, um, tethered cut to length, tethered uh, shovel, the more you can leave it open, 
as long as you get the job done that you want and you're within your analysis of your environmental review document, um, that will give you more contractors. Uh, hopefully that will lower your cost. But if you do that, you have to understand the requirements <clears throat> of all those different logging systems and you have to design your projects so that they will all work, whether it's access, forwarding yarding distances, uh, leaf stand densities, landings, other things. If you're gonna open it up to all the different systems, you have to design a project where all the different systems will work. And if you have a, a system that you really do not want for a reason, then you have to specify that such and such system is not acceptable. Um, understanding your resource effects uh, of all the different logging systems. When, you're, when your specialists are doing their analysis, they need to analyze for worst case scenario, uh, your most severe impacts, um, whether it's soils or snags or economics or safety, you have to analyze worst case. Uh, if you're going to have people outside of cabs in a skyline system setting chokers, realize that a lot of those snags that you want to retain are probably going to have to come down for safety reasons. Uh, conversely, if everybody's protected in a cab, if it's a highly mechanized show and it's all done with tether, then you can probably retain a lot more of those snags, but you do have to analyze for kind of a worst case scenario. Okay, the projects that I've been associated with, um, they've been in three different regions. My region kind of loaned me out to region two and four to help out with some projects. And we're briefly gonna go over them. Uh, we had, uh, region two had a project at Monarch Pass Ski Area. Region three was Ski Apache and region four was Bald Mountain, uh, Sun Valley. Okay, first one was Ski Apache. Um, this was down at Rio Doso, uh, about 200 acres of hazard trees within the ski area. It was in a stand replacement fire. Uh, we needed to take the hazard trees down. Uh, no markets at all for the material. It was all forwarded off the hill. And as you can see right here, uh, those are the forwarder trails. They took it down to piles and the district burned the piles as soon as they were off the hill, uh, completed in six weeks. Uh, that was Miller Timber in 2018, did that with a tethered cut to link system. Uh, Bald Mountain Stewardship is Sun Valley on the Sawtooth National Forest. Uh, fuels reduction and forest health were the objectives. They've completed 110 acres out of 830 in the project area, uh, 2019 and 2020. It was a cost share with Sun Valley Corporation where they kicked in money and the Forest Service kicked in money. Uh, limited, very limited products, uh, went to a rough cut sawmill in Shoshone and local firewooders. They did have some extreme forwarding distances. The, uh, it wasn't really planned to have log truck access. It's a ski area and they wound up forwarding material over a mile off of the mountain. Uh, this lower photo here is the parking lot of one of the lodges at Sun Valley and the forwarders went right between the buildings at some of the ski lodges to deck this material down there. Uh, the upper right photo here is an area that had been thinned uh, that provided new glade skiing for Sun Valley. And the lower photo is looking right down a forwarder uh, harvester corridor. The city town of Sun Valley in Ketchum is right over here, just out of, out of the screen. Monarch Pass was uh, in Colorado, uh, just outside of Salida on the Pike San Isabel. This one was dead spruce. It was a collaborative with the Arkansas River Watershed Co Collaborative. Uh, the contract with Miller Timber, the contractor again on all three of these was with the Arkansas Watershed Collaborative, uh, 183 acres done so far in 2020 and they have a long ways to go. The project area was, was 3,000 acres. <clears throat> Interesting thing on this one is it was a CE under the farm bill and I said well you're going to have to do a forest plan amendment because they had a hard and fast slope limit in there. They said well we can't do that under the farm bill. No forest plan amendments. Uh, we'll have to do something else. 
there was one line in the forest plan that said uh, something to the effect of ground-based operations can go up to 65% if done with high flotation equipment. This was written back in the 80s. And so I'm sure whoever did that had an FMC in mind, a live track skitter. And we said, well, this tethered cut to length is high flotation equipment. That was the only reason that we were able to utilize uh, the, the equipment that we did was that one line in the forest plan because we weren't able to do a forest plan amendment. So some common elements of these. Um, we did use uh, Miller timber. Uh, they were all done with cut to length, tethered. They were all in ski area. Uh, the forests, I think, were generally pleased with the work that was done. We had limited to no markets for the material that was cut. So there wasn't a lot of timber value involved. Uh, we did have outside funding for all of these projects and they were expensive, $3,000 to $5,500 an acre when all was said and done. Uh, if we had local contractors and if we had strong viable markets, that would of course improve the economics of all three of these projects. Here are some other projects in region three that I was involved with in the planning um, that all allowed for steep slope ground-based equipment. Uh, it's in the analysis and it can be done. Pueblo Ridge is on the Carson in Northern New Mexico. Uh, South Sacramento uh, down in the Lincoln, a big project with a lot of steep ground. Uh, Hacienda is on the Prescott, mainly Chaparral, but there is a, a fair amount of conifer, uh, 30,000 acres or so in some very challenging urban interface. Uh, Flagstaff Watershed Protection on the Coconino. Um, the steep ground units were mainly treated with helicopter. 10,000 acre project area, but a, a smaller portion of that was steep. Uh, Bill Williams, kind of a similar thing on the Kaibab. Uh, 15,000 acres, uh, much more limited area uh, that was steep ground, and that was also done with the helicopter. And the biggest project is probably Four, four Fry. Uh, uh, for Forest Restoration Initiative, for Fry, uh, the Rim Country EIS, where we analyzed for uh, steep slope operations. There isn't a lot of steep ground there, uh, 1.2 million acres, but most of it is pretty darn flat, but there was some steep stuff on the Tonto Forest. And this is something that could work too. Working on the steep ground is nothing new. This was back in 1900. Um, this was uh, a log chute down into the Klamath River. They logged off the, the plateau up above as a big plateau and they needed to get it down to the river so they constructed a log chute. Uh, that log chute is half a mile long and it drops about 850 feet. Uh, they said that the logs by the time they hit the river were going about 80 miles an hour. Uh, what's interesting to me is all the, all the logs that jumped the chute here. So clever stuff they did over a hundred years ago. So that is what I have for you folks. Um, I think we're gonna have some time to answer questions uh, after the presentations for this panel is done. So pleasure to be here today and look forward to answering some questions. Thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot, Bob. Um, We've got some questions coming in, but we'll, uh, again, for the, in the interest of time, we're a little bit behind here. We'll move on to the next uh, presentation. And that, that presentation will be given, is give, being given by Brett Morissette. And the title of it is uh, Soil Impacts of Tethered, um, Tethered Forest Harvesting Operations on Steep Slopes in the U.S. West. And that's three case studies. Um, real quick background on Brett. He's a senior faculty research assistant in, in the Department of Forest Engineering, Resources and Management at Oregon State University. He uh, has a BS in forest engineering, master's in forest hydrology, both from Oregon State, and he has held his current position since July 2015. Um, his work has included soil sampling, analysis, watershed studies, and recently tethered logging studies throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, Brett's been working with Dr. Woodham Chung and his team at Oregon State since 2018 to uh, further the understanding of impacts of tethered logging 
on different soil types and water. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll take it over, Brett. All right, uh, I pre-recorded, so Damon, are you gonna fire it off? Hello, this is Brett Morrison with Oregon State University. And I have a presentation to share with you, soil impacts of tethered forest harvesting operations on steep slopes in the Western US, three case studies. And let's see if it'll work. Our three studies took place in two of them in Oregon, one in Washington. The first one was the quick draw study on the Oregon State Research Forest near Corvallis, Oregon. This was a thinning cut to length um, in the Oregon Coast Range. The second study was on Lone Rock Resources property and harvested with their crew. It was a tethered clear cut with skyline yarding in the Cascade foothills near Sutherland, Oregon, which is near Roseburg, Oregon. The third study was Greenhorn tethered study near Moscow, Idaho, on the St. Joseph National Forest managed by the Nez Pierce Clearwater National Forest. This was a tethered res restoration cut with a tethered bar saw and multiple yarding techniques. What is tethered logging? It uses a cable and winch system to add system stability. Um, there are two types right now. There's one that's a standalone winch on board, which is like the picture on the bottom left. The second uses a base machine at the top of the hill to spool out cable to a feller buncher or tethered skitter on the slope through a synchronized radio controlled system. What does tethering do? Tethering takes a portion of the machine load and redistributes it over the tracks or wheels. Um, an attachment on the uphill side of the mach machine creates a rotational effect, which gives more track area into effective ground contact. More effective ground contact reduces maximum ground pressure and slip and increases machine stability. Here's a diagram of pressure cell testing um, without tether. On the upper left, you can see the pressure cells were black at the bottom, red the next one up the hill, blue, and then green at the top under the tracks. In this one, in almost all positions, the downhill pressure cells uh, have the highest ground pressure. When you add 10 tons of tension, as seen in the bottom right, um, this tethering redistributes the weight and pulls some of the machine weight back over the other cells. The black is no longer the highest, and the blue and red take a, fair, a good amount of load. Why do we want to do tethered logging? Safety. Timber falling is one of the most dangerous jobs in the U.S. with the highest fatality and injury rates. In 2015, there are 132.7 fatalities per 100,000 full-time equivalent workers. There's a limited workforce willing to do this work on steep slopes. Um, the hours, the work is physical, hard, elements, hot, cold, wet, snow. So, yeah. And then there's economic efficiency. Mechanized harvesting is more productive than hand falling. Um, you can see in the bottom left, there's the traditional hand faller with a hard hat, chaps, gloves, eye protection. And then there's the rigging crew with hard hats and gloves. And then you put people in tethered machines. They're in a climate controlled cab that's uh, forestry rated, take impacts. So if something falls that's not expected, they're in a much better condition. The first study we did was the OSU quick draw Thinning it was a cut to length operation. The total harvest area was 144 acres, 142 acres of 60 year old Douglas fir, average DBH of 14 inches and 108 feet tall. These were on clay soils that were well drained. This was conducted in August, 2017, which is the dry season. 
using Ponce Bear and Elephant King. And this was a comparison of tethered versus untethered. So before the, <clears throat> sorry, before the harvest, um, bulk density samples were taken and penetrometer readings at 10 centimeter intervals from 10 to 15 centimeters in depth at 25 or 50 foot spacing throughout the corridor. Corridor A was about half the length of corridor B, so corridor B had the 50 foot spacing. This took into account soil compaction at multiple depths. So after the harvesting and forwarding, again, the bulk density was collected along with the penetrometer readings. And this time it was between tracks, under the track and outside the track. On the untethered, we see compaction after the harvester went through, as well as after the forwarder picked up all the logs. Whereas with the tethered system, we see that there was loosening after the forest, the harvester went through felling the trees and that loosening stayed at the surface, bulk density sampling. And then there was some compaction right under the tracks at 10, 20 and 30 centimeters and outside the track. The tether may help keep the equipment operator in a better path because he's on the cable. The second study was Lone Rock Resources in Sutherland, Oregon. This was a clear cut, about 200 trees per acre, 35 acres, average tree size, 220 board feet, using a Tiger Cat LD LS 855D teller, tethered feller buncher with a bar saw, a Cat 330D base machine, summit attachment synchronized tethered system, Yarding was done with a Thunderbird TSY 255 yarder with Acme carriage. This was a comparison of hand falling with Skyline yarding. Um, sky, the Skyline, the hand falling area was yarded with the same yarder. And this was done in March and April of 2018, which is the wet season in this area. <clears throat> the site had silty clay loam soils. They were well drained. Landowner and logging crew were with the same company, Lone Rock and we're able to schedule things to work with us a little bit. Site so required a hand, portion to be hand fallen. It was inaccessible for a tethered machine because of a cliff and the company was willing to add some more area to the hand falling for our study. And this was on Douglas fir forest and Mediterranean climate in the Oregon Cascades with fine texture soils on slopes 30 to 60%. The main takeaway from this Slide is the soil depth in the jory is 240, 254 centimeters and 92 centimeters in the nekia and well drained. So we did the same pre and post sampling technique for bulk density and penetrometer as was done in quick draw, one sampling before, three samples after, um, outside the tracks, on the track, between the tracks. In addition, we had added infiltration rates and soil moisture content, and we set up erosion and sediment capture fences. Um, also installed soil moisture probes and uh, rain gauge to follow rain precipitation. Pre-soil harvest, pre-harvest soil strength was about the same no statistical difference between pre soil characteristics in the machine and hand cut areas. Hand cut soil strength post yarding. Um, there is some statistically significant loosening of the bulk density. Um, no significant changes. Otherwise, there are some minor increases in the hand cut area on the yarding corridor in the top 10 centimeters, um, some decrease, which may have been just seasonality and a little bit of water came throughout the between pre and post collection. The post falling, um, you can see where my face is blocking the screen. There's the 
trees that have been fallen laid out in the corridors in the machine area. Um, you can see the lower picture red lines are the skyline corridors for the tethered area and the yellow lines are the skyline corridors approximately for the hand cut area. Much fewer skyline corridors needed because of pre-bunching with the uh, tethered system. Again, um, any significant changes in soil compaction were decreases, um, both post-felling and post-yarding. Bulk density in the top six centimeters of the soil in the hand fallen area, there was some lower bulk density in the undisturbed area post treatment. Bulk density in the top six centimeters in the tethered study area, um, we had some loosening in post falling and again, some loosening post yarding, no significant increase in compaction that we observed. Infiltration rate, we used a mini disc infiltrometer. Um, again, we took one reading per station pre-treatment and at the three station, three points per station post-treatment. Post um, a one value is no change as can seen, be seen in the lower left outside, basically exactly the same infiltration rate. Um, that's tethered post falling and between tracks was an increase as well as at the track. Post yarding in the hand corridor, this is the upper right graph that I'm partially blocking. Um, there was a slight in decrease in infiltration rate at in the hand corridor and an increase outside the corridor. Post Yarding in the tethered area, there is increases in infiltration in uh, between area and track, and some decreases on the corridor and outside, and about no change on the track corridor combination. Um, no significant changes in infiltration rate. And we had relatively high infiltration rates on this side site as indicated from the previous slide showing the soil description. A infiltration, this is K value, an infiltration rate of 0.0005 centimeters per second would correlate to about 0.7 inches an hour of infiltration, which the Northwest rarely gets anywhere close to that as a sustained rainfall. No real significant changes in infiltration rate. We installed soil moisture probes at the depths of, oh, here's soil moisture and precipitation during the study time, about 900 millimeters of rain in the orange line and daily uh, about 55 millimeters was the maximum rainfall. So here's a, here are graphs from soil moisture probes that we installed. They were installed in the track and just offset about 10 feet. And on the left side are the track probes and they all show higher soil moisture throughout the growing season, which led us to a seedling study, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Here's the seedling study. We, after we looked at the soil moisture probes and saw that there was appeared to be higher soil moisture under the track, we decided to do a seedling study installing planting seedlings directly on the track and offset from the track about 10 feet, as well as in the hand cut and in the main corridor that we studied. Um, Seedlings were collected pre and post growing season in 2019 and 20. And this is from the most recent collection in fall of 2020. And it appears that the tracks had the best, had better 
seedling productivity than the non-tract area 10 feet away, and that the corridor had better seedling growth than the hand cut area. Still, this is brand new. We haven't gotten any statistics, but interesting. We installed erosion fences. Over the summer and fall of 2018, there was no rainfall between the installations. The fences burned in the 2020 Archie Creek fire, and we had no sediment capture over the two winters they were installed. So the takeaways from this, there was no significant difference between traditional hand falling techniques and cable yarding to tethered feller bunching and cable yarding. The area of disturbance from cable yarding with the tethered system is more concentrated than hand area, four or five corridors versus for 15 hectares, 30 acres versus six or more corridors for three hectares, five acres. Possibly less overall site disturbance. And if there is site disturbance in the tethered area because there are fewer corridors, it might be easier to mitigate. Soil moisture monitoring indicated higher soil moisture directly under the tracks, which led us to the seedling study. And it indicates there may be a benefit to seedling productivity, but that is a big maybe currently. Greenhorn study. St. Joseph National Forest, managed by the Nez Pierce Clearwater. So the restoration harvest, approximately 10 trees per acre left. There is tethered cutting and tethered skitter, tethered cutting, tethered shovel, hand cutting and cable logging with chokers, tethered cutting and cable logging with grapple. And here's a, in the background of this picture are the toys they used. Study, study site, about 3,200 feet to 3,800 feet. Average DBH 16 inches, average total height 91.3 feet, sandy silt loam, sandy loam to sandy silt to silt loam soil, Mount Mazama ash, six species of conifer on 40 45-ish per, percent slopes. So corridor A was the tethered timber pro bar timber pro and bar saw with a tethered grapple skitter. Corridor B tethered bar saw, tethered shovel, non-synchronized. C was traditional hand cut with two fallers and a yoder with a slab carriage. And D was tethered bar saw with a yoder with a grapple carriage. Here's a look at the corridors relatively close to each other. Our sampling, this time we took three samples per station at Center line and offset 15 feet. Uh, we were on site July 7th through the 14th, and there was no rain. Cutting equipment, go through this quick. Tethered equipment, ground based, we had the John Deere skitter and John Deere shovel, swing shovel, and logging equipment, the John Deere smart yoder, slab carriage, and then the grapple carriage from the summit. Machine combinations, there was the base machine, which was the 330C L and the seven, summit tethered system in corridors A, B, and C. The cutting machine was the same for A, B, and C, the tethered Timber Pro 765C. The John Deere 948L to grapple skitter with synchronized summit system. John Deere 3756G swing machine with a Summit Smart Yoder um, non synchronized. And then uh, the John Deere was used as a Yoder with a Summit SG80 grapple carriage, two hand fallers, and a, a Yoder with a slab carriage and two 20 foot chokers was used in corridor C. Compaction results. We did have compaction in corridor A from the skitter with the penetrometer readings and loosening of the surface soil bulk density. Corridor B, there was loosening of the bulk density and um, first reading at 10 centimeters and some compaction at depth. Hand area had no, had loosening. And the corridor D, the yoder with the grapple carriage had increased. Compaction, not all significant. 
soil displacement data has been collected and analyzed, has not been has not been analyzed, is being analyzed. We pulled a string 30 feet across the corridor, and at every foot, we took a measurement of the cross slope profile. Continuation of research is looking at the left, right, and center comparison and top to bottom, individual point comparison, soil displacement, and erosion impacts we installed for erosion fences and four sets of soil moisture probes. Um, again, in the tracked travel area and offset undisturbed. Collective conclusion from the three studies, um, while there may be some disturbance on the three studies we have conducted so far, those disturbances do not appear to be detrimental compared to currently accepted hardest practices. We would like to expand our research area to more areas with different soil types to see if what we have observed continues to other areas. Here, I'm gonna quickly go over ASAP analysis for equipment soil operations planning, a ARC map add-in tool um, developed from Ben Lashinsky and Wudam Chung and the Missoula Technology Development Center. Um, you can enter your machine type, ground slope, soil properties from Sergo, percent sand, silt, and clay and whether you're operating in wet and dry systems. Phase one, this is estimates total soil disturbance given tension, um, soil disturbance, displacement, soil compaction at four, eight, 12, and 16 inch depth and rutting magnitude. It complies compatible with forest service disturbance assessment guidelines, determine stability of safe operation on given slope and example of output in the bottom left there. Here we see compaction with no tether. White areas are inaccessible. As we go through, the white areas will decrease with, as we add tension. So five tons smaller. And now we have rutting without tether and the inches on the scale there. White areas are inaccessible again. Soil displacement, wide areas are inaccessible. And then there's an accessibility phase two where you can enter your, estimate the tether tension required to meet the disturbance thresholds. You enter what your allowable compaction, displacement and rutting is, and it will, and safe operation and do. Here we'll look through some slides of how that worked. Um, so this you would click instead of disturbance accessibility, enter your maximum machine ten tension, tension, displacement, sinkage, and compaction. Here we have 15% increase of bulk density and disturbance of 15% of trank length and four inches of rutting allowable. Five tons of tension, 10 tons of tension. 15 tons of tension. ASAP, with new technology come new challenges. This is a chance to look at things before you're on the ground, see if the site may be right for you. Quantitative planning tools based on physics is a start. Knowledge about local soils and site conditions are critical. And here are some acknowledgements for our, from our research over these three projects. Too many people to name but a great thanks to all that participated and helped. And now I am going to stop share. Great, great presentation, Brett. Um, I, think, I think we're, I've been told by the meeting um, organizer that we have until 10.50 for questions, so my clock is telling me we basically have 13 minutes. So, um, and we'll, we'll make it up. Um, Damon will make an announcement after, after the fact. But um, anyway, just going back, there has been a number of questions that have, that have come in. Um, we'll go back to almost, almost an hour, over an hour ago. Uh, Matt Etzenhauser asked, how does the cable assist equipment technique 
technique accommodate coverage of the entire stand when lateral reaches outside of the fall line corridor? The second question, do you need more corridors or can you, or can operations occur angled on a side slope? It wasn't addressed to anybody specifically, but I... I'll, I'll answer that, Rich, and, and maybe others could provide some context as well, but yeah, I think what he's asking is, you know, machines have a certain limited reach and outside that reach, how do you, how do you fell those trees with a, a tethered machine? And the short answer is, yeah, you need to uh, provide more corridors for the machine to travel down. So you, if you're using a separate anchor machine at the top, like we've seen pictured, um, you know, you'll have to move that down the road or relocate it and start a new corridor. But there's also a, a common employed technique where an operator will go down a hill, straight perpendicular down the hill, and then they will turn around a tree or stump and redirect the cable. So the cable will actually bite or bend around that stump or tree, but then that allows the machine to um, go down another uh, angled slope, side slope, but still maintain perpendicular uh, to that new slope change. Um, so I, I hope to uh, maybe point out some of those in the video session during lunch. But yeah, as you can see, Brett showed in, in that uh, photo of the two units side by side, you can also shovel log uh, or swing those wood over to yarder corridors. And in that case, they are able to reduce those yarding corridors to four for that relatively large area. So that's another benefit. So one other thing that you can do as Hunter mentioned of using the stump, um, it's not recommended to turn on that stump more than 45 degrees in case you pull it. There's not too much cable slack to be on a free fall. Hopefully the machine's stable, but things can happen. So 45 is the state of Oregon's maximum recommended bend. I'll show a video in lunch too. There's, you know, that is a greater risk when the, when the machine, typically when you have that base winch machine, because the rope's always pulling or moving and you can build friction and heat and, uh, and create a fire risk rubbing on the trees like that. Uh, with the ones that are in some of the cut length system where the winch is integrated into the felling machine itself or the forwarder, that rope is more or less static when you bend around that tree. But yeah, there are different safety codes you should be aware of in, in your region. Um, and I hope to show a video that shows an alternative to that in the break where you can use a block or, or pulley to redirect the cable. And with, with the trail spacing, what we've, we've emphasized in our forest service training is, you know, on the, on the cut to length equipment, if the boom reaches 32 feet, you know, that could, that's a maximum of 64 feet of reach. And we'll tell people don't ever go to the max you know, go 50, 50 to 55 feet between your trails. And that's what you're gonna to need to, uh, to, to reach everything easily. Okay, moving, moving on. I wanna make sure we, that each panelist gets at least a question or so. Um, I did find a question that was in the chat that was, I think, directed towards, uh, to Bob. Um, that's from Jay Anzalone. And basically what it, the question is, was firewood considered on the mm -hmm. projects? Uh, before I answer that, I guess I'll mention, you, you can see my name says Candace Rich. That's, that's my wife. And for those of you who know my wife and are disappointed that it's me and not her, because she's a lot prettier and a lot smarter than me. Um, she, she's here today, but she couldn't, couldn't be on the, uh, the conference. So uh, in answer to the question, um, the ski Apache one was in a ski area and they were really hustling to get that done. They had about a, a two week window of opportunity between Sacramento salamander restrictions and the opening of ski season. And they did a great job just to get the wood off the hill. And the emphasis was getting the ski area operational. And I, I had mentioned something about firewood over there. Um, I, I really don't think they wanted people in there cutting up firewood um, and the road in there is not great. So uh, the real emphasis was getting that cleaned up and they had a very narrow window of opportunity and the district was burning those piles just as, as fast as they could. 
uh, at Monarch, that was all actually utilized. It went to Montrose Forest Products about uh, two hours away. Um, so that was went out in saw log form, even though it was dead spruce. At uh, Sun Valley, that did come off and it went down in the parking lot and was decked. And like I said in the presentation, that did go to a rough cut sawmill and to local firewooders. So when they had a market, they they utilized it. They did have, they did utilize everything on two of the projects, and on the one, you know, the overwhelming uh, purpose of that was we got to get this done fast and get the ski area open. Great, thanks, Bob. Um, I've got one here that's directed. I think I'm, looks like it's directed to Brett um, from Preston Green. Uh, any plans to look at continued long-term effects from any of the field studies? Um, there's no plan now. The OSU site, which was Preston's master's studies area is 15, 20 minutes away. So we might be able to pop out there and go down the corridors again and see how they've recovered, but there's no, no long-term plans. Um, the Idaho study, which I actually said was Washington when I went through my presentation, it, we need to go back there and collect the soil moisture probes, check the erosion fences. When they checked them locally for us, they were covered in snow in late, late September, early October. So don't know if anything's moved, but uh, some of the erosion fences burned in the Archie Creek fire down in Sutherland. So not a whole lot to continue there since the fire went through. That is gonna be a driver for anything that happens now. So Idaho, maybe OSU, we'll see. Great, great, thanks Brett. Um, another question here from, uh, from one of our keynote speakers, Lauren, Lauren Kellogg. Uh, it's directed to Hunter. Um, who produces the new cable planning software? Yeah, so the, the newer types that have that innovative display of, of payloads on the corridors, there's two programs that do that. The first that you saw the screenshot from is CHIPS, which is Cable, cable Harvest Planning Solutions. Uh, that's a software manufactured out of New Zealand I believe they're using it in some places in Canada and Washington as well. That's integrated into ArcMap uh, as a toolbar extension. Uh, the other uh, program that's also very good is uh, uh, RoadEng. Their new, newest version has a payload analysis uh, component in it. So you can do your road and landing design and also do your payload analysis at the same time, which is nice. Um, but it's not integrated into ArcMap. And that's made by, what is it, SoftTree in, in British Columbia. And then real quick, we've got one that was right below it related to that. Um, can this camera technology be used for log truck traffic control in restricted roads and or highways? Yeah, it really depends on the on the quality of the, the camera system and, and particularly the transmission of the signal. So that's been the uh, major issue with, with all the cameras mounted on carriages or, or those tripods uh, is getting over that line of sight issue. So um, they have different ranges, different companies, different models. So you would want to check into that range. But yeah, using it for something like traffic management, you know, I can see all sorts of ways that tripod type one can be used um, to monitor all parts of your operation and traffic management would just be one of them. Great, yeah, thanks Hunter. Um, here's another one directed to, uh, it looks like Brett um, from Catherine Thomas. Uh, I've been excitedly awaiting results of Morris' study on the Nez Pierce Clearwater. Has this been published yet? And where might I find a copy of the results Thanks so much for presenting. Uh, we have not gotten the Nez Pierce worked up yet. Uh, we got the bulk density samples done, done and through the oven, I think it was in mid-November. So it's taken a long time to deal with the field data. 
Austin Finster, that's his masters. He's working on the soils data. Um, so he is scheduled to defend by June. So hopefully something will be out by then or before. Thanks, Brett. Uh, this one doesn't have any who it's directed to from James Maxwell. It looks like a general question for the panel. Do grapple carriage systems require more line shifts than carriages that use chokers? Yes, yeah. um, which is why, you know, uh, mobile anchor machines, as you saw pictured, are, are highly preferred. However, if we're employing a um, tethered feller buncher, for example, and, and again, as Brett showed in those photos, we can do some uh, pre-bunching or, or swinging two corridors. So we might be able to reduce those. And, and that has, again, those huge flow on effects to the productivity of yarding. If we have to set up half as many corridors, um, that's probably an extra day or two of actual productive yarding. Great, thanks. Thanks, Hunter. Any other input from panelists? Okay, we'll move on to another one. Got another minute. <laughs> uh, okay, here's from, one from Zach Miller for a tethered system. Is the harvesting cost comparable to traditional line machines because of increased productions, production and or more tons per day? Well, if we're, I guess if we're, it depends what tether configuration we're talking about. If, it, if it's a tethered, tethered ground-based system, um, you know, my experience has been that they're more competitive than the cable systems. Um, and I, I, it depends whether we're just doing the, the cutting or whether we're actually doing the extraction with, with the tether also. If, if they weren't more competitive than the cable systems, you know, we wouldn't be using them. I agree. I think there's a lot of a lot of variables in play there, as um, Rich noted. But the the general trend is is that yes, tethered felling is more expensive per unit of volume uh, per cubic foot per ton per MBF with a tethered system than with hand falling. However, the the yarding costs are, are substantially reduced through that improved productivity. So that's where the real savings are. Um, you know, I heard a crew saying they, swing yarder crew saying they averaged eight to 10 loads a day. And then they got into where it was felled with a tethered feller buncher and, and all of a sudden they were doing 18 loads a day and they couldn't believe it. Um, but the, there was a big concern am, amongst them um, cable yarder, uh, cable logging crews that, you know, these machines were gonna rep replace cable yarding crews. And, and I still think there's a need for cable logging crews, especially when we think about our infrastructure and um, economic transportation distances. So you've got to, you can shovel uphill with a tethered machine, um, but it might be more productive to yard that up uh, 3000 feet than shovel it up 3000 feet. Just like in, in ground base, you know, to follow up on what Hunter said, the the advantage of the mechanical cutting isn't so much the cutting itself; it's in the subsequent skidding. So it's the same the same concept that he pointed out. Uh, the savings is in the yarding. Hunter, and, and again, there's that savings. When, when we were in Idaho, they only could do about three or four swings before the logs would just start sliding down the hill because the branches would break off. So you seem to have had, at least at that, there was a limited distance for a shovel uphill. And, and there's, you know, why there's not that cost savings in felling, as we said, because it is more expensive felling. Um, there's some flow on benefits in terms of uh, less breakage, so less waste on the site. We're actually recovering more logs. I'll show you that in the video session, but also, um, you know, in, in terms of the time, like we're talking about scale and pace of operations, you know, we can fell the same area with a tethered feller buncher in one week versus, you know, what would take three weeks with a team of hand fallers. So the speed at which we can accomplish the operation uh, is greatly improved. 
Great. Great input. We got a lot of good questions. Uh, looks like we're three minutes over, even 1050. So I'll let Damon kind of take it from here. Damon, uh, he'll kind of fill everybody in on, on what's ever, what, what, what we're going to do as far as time wise. And, but everybody, I, yeah, big hand for, for the panel. Great job. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Uh, just to let everybody know, we're, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we'll adjust slightly. Um, we'll take a quick break now until 11 o'clock Mountain Time, about seven minutes, and then we'll reconvene and we'll start um, panel two, which is about uh, innovative forest products ideas. And that'll run into the long lunch we had planned and cut into that a little bit. So it'll run 11 to 1220 Mountain Time. So let's take a quick break and uh, we'll see you all soon in a couple minutes. Again, the uh, just want to let you know you all can uh, use the same the the, the uh, web link Damon sent out to re-enter uh, our webinar using the same uh, password. See you in a few minutes. <laughs>